And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. Coming to us straight from the double-headed monster that is Haunted Table Games, in the red corner we have Caleb Zane Hewitt. Hopefully I got the Hello. last part right. And Absolutely. In, and in the blue corner we have Sean Ireland. Also, hello. I'm so sorry I didn't bring an offering to the monastery. <laughs> um, Sean, this energy, we're in opposite corners of the ring, so I'm going to need you to square up. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, squ um, square. I'm not right. going to go easy on you. That's great. I'm talking great. to my coach and I'm asking what form I should use. <laughs> oh. I'm totally winded from the long walk up those stairs. Yeah, there were a lot <laughs> of stairs. Why is it up so high? Yeah. Well, well, to, well, to, um, to, we to weed people out. Yeah. Yes. Well, no. Well, yeah. If you if you can't make it up the stairs, then you just uh, you just can't fight. But I'm here to win, and by win, I mean give you all the information you need to have about Triangle Agency, yeah. Mildra. <laughs> so, a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings. So, I'd like both of you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a couple of like origin moments, but I think the thing I can point to for why it stuck with me forever is the game Neverwinter Nights. I don't know if you ever played Neverwinter Nights. Um, I have back. Yes, um, early one or two. Uh, one original. All right. When I was when I was much younger, I, this I would have started when I was like nine. Um, I started getting into online Neverwinter Night servers and like role play servers there, and I had played a little bit of D and D with my dad and with some friends. But by, when I started playing Neverwinter Nights, it was like, oh wow, I can do this anytime I have free time. I can learn about these characters in this world and join all these different servers. And um, so as a kid, I spent years. I ended, I was playing on Neverwinter Nights one like role play servers on and off through college but um the when i was a kid playing through those and playing characters in those is really what gave me the role play bug and then when i got a little older and was able to run campaigns myself i translated all that i had learned from that into um gming most of the time so it started with neverwinter but it definitely grew from there uh for me uh i was i want to say 12 and my older brother said, hey, my friends and I want to play Dungeons and Dragons. Do you want to play? I was like, oh my goodness, yes. And they were like, congratulations. Here's the Dungeon Master's book. You are the Dungeon <laughs> Master. And so that's when I like, that I learned about the game at the same time that I was saddled with the responsibility of running it. Um, <laughs> and it didn't last long, but I did like gain an appreciation and... Uh, 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 love for the game and that after that experience it sort of lied dormant until college um, when uh, uh, we were organizing a risk night and risk never happened because at some point during planning one of us was just like do you guys want to play Dungeons and Dragons? It was around the time that 4th uh, edition was just being announced and uh, the, the starter rules were coming out and so we put it all on red and we tried that out and that campaign lasted for you know two and a half years until people started scattering from the city mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know two kind of accidental encounters for me yeah a few years apart well the greatest innovations were done by those who had no idea what they were doing yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah sean at 12 was redefining D and D at the time. I was really pushing boundaries with my truly <laughs> hideously cringeworthy villains. <laughs> and then Sean and I met uh, both working at an after-school program where we were running D and D for kids. So uh, 
every day we had all this time where the two of us would sit and uh, and just sort of talk about like what was working in our GMing for kids, what we liked about games. We spent a lot of time just like chatting about role playing games and board games and our lives while we waited outside of these schools to pick up these kids. And then we're getting this incredible practice where you're playing with uh, not just players, but occasionally like players who are going to make it the most difficult for you that any player can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they're eight <laughs> and seven. Um, and uh, from that friendship of that time was kind of born us uh, keeping in touch and talking about games until finally we settled on a project to work on and Triangle Agency is what that was. Mm -hmm. And When it comes now, when it comes to tr when it comes to Triangle Agency, you've you've mentioned a bunch you've mentioned a bunch of um, of inspirations on the Kickstarter page, and and I always appreciate when every project has a little um, list of inspirations, a little appendix, and if you will. But mm -hmm. even before I even before I jumped on it, when all that I had was just the preview page, I was getting control vibes, and I'm guessing that was that was one of the bigger. Um, pieces of influence? Uh, uh, definitely. We put it at the top of our influence list. Uh, I think because the time that I spent with Control, I really, really hold close to my heart. Mm -hmm. And the sorts of stories they tell with that game, and they are, they're like the, the specific story they're telling with that game, uh, tapped into something that I just loved, love, love, love to see. This like big this interest in the huge and and impossible to understand like cosmic level horror and uh and supernatural energy but then given this like really human and specific lens to look at it through just like the like scp foundation stuff you get the thing that's so cool about that is you get to watch very human people trying to understand something so much bigger than them mm -hmm. um but control is the thing that like sparked my brain in the direction to start thinking about that stuff in the in recent terms at least for sure yeah um and i i can certainly see it and i've oh not too long ago on the on this podcast we ended up having a discussion about the about the part of, i think part of the reason why david cage is treated like a meme whereas sam sam lake is also treated like a meme, but a bit, but a bit more affectionately. <laughs> um, and one of the things I said is that even though I have so, I have some issues with cer with certain parts of Control, um, compared to what came before, Control feels more feels more like a Remedy game than say Quantum Break did. I, I yeah I. I should be honest, I'm not especially familiar with David Cage's work because I, the reputation has been like, oh, this isn't something I need to really bother with. But I will say from what I understand, what I see people respond to that's different between those two things is I think often I hear that people find David Cage's work to be like manipulative, like emotionally manipulative to an extent, whereas I find control and other things by Remedy and, and Sam Lake... Uh, generally, to be very sincere feeling, um, like uh, work that is trying to find emotions through, like the way that you want fiction to find emotions by like doing the work and connecting you to the characters, and not by trying to um, use the tools of a video game to kind of trick your brain, <laughs> you know. Well, I think when it comes to Cage, I think I think one of the best. Um, demonstrations of I think the issue that people have with him is is best emu is best um, described in the in, in the I like dogs um, incident when it comes to Detroit become human because somebody had asked um, Brian Brian Deshar who's the vo who played Connor in that game his favorite line and he said I like dogs and um, Ca <laughs> Cage which Cage was um, not happy about that. <laughs> and apparently he also wasn't happy about the fact that Descartes, Deschamps and um and my, and Ironside, uh, Michael Ironside were um doing a whole lot of ad-libbing and it was just, it was driving him crazy. But um <laughs> on the other hand, if you're get if you're going to bring in 
if you're going to bring in actors, you should you should expect some degree of of ad libbing, especially especially depending on your script. Um, but it but it was but what I took out of that is Kate is Cage, wa- very much wanting to very much wanting to be an very much wanting to be an artiste, whereas Sam Lake wants to just t- wants to just tell stories in his own unique way. Yeah, that's exact. I think I think there you said in uh, very good words what I was trying to get to, which is that exact feeling that it's somebody who's who's not trying too hard to uh, to push you somewhere, but someone who's like trying to go along with you. Well, uh, in the story, Lake's for Lake's first major project was was of course Max Payne, and when he when that was tackled, he had no he had no idea on how script writing works. But he, but he had this. He had the idea in his head that he wanted to. Do, that he wanted to do, and it was a case of having more passion than common sense. Yeah, I wish I could come with you. I just don't know much about David Cage, <laughs> but oh. I believe you in all this. Well, same over here in the blue corner. Oh. I'm just sitting here. I'm. I've been flexing and doing my windmills. <laughs> you put us in the ring, um, and we're both losing. Well, yeah. I shouldn't. Sam Lake is responsible for um, for control and just the remedy, just all of the remedy games. Whereas um, David Cage is responsible for stuff like Detroit Become Human or Heavy Rain. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Just to just just to make sure that no, that nothing yeah. is confused. Um, right. I'll say I can say uh, that the biggest influence that Heavy Rain has had on my life is that glitch where you could make the characters scream Sean. For- <laughs> <laughs> Which, I bet you've had a lot of experience with that. I got a glitch. lot of experience. Which kind with that of, one. kind that kind that, as much of a as much of an amusing glitch as that is, that kind of illustrates what I what I was getting at, where, um, Cage takes himself takes himself and and his storytelling, um, way too seriously. Um, Possibly, I think I think that's a that could be a reason why that glitch feels so funny, is because it's you know sort of piercing through uh what's supposed to be a, a very melodramatic moment um, yeah whereas there's there's plenty of melodrama in in say and say max Payne or so, or some of the other stuff but there's also moments of moments of levity like say in i suppose a good example in control would be the live action cut scenes they're genius uh, and brilliant and i won't yeah. hear otherwise i love them yeah, some, a lot of a lot of them having some having some degree over here of, in the blue corner. of dark of um dark humor or or just or 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 just putting or just putting them in front of a camera and just and just say do, just um having them ad lib the rest of it. Um, the kind of the kind of silliness that inevitably happens when you have people in an off in some sort of office or work setting and they ha- and they have to do something to keep themselves sane. Hmm. Because you know it's not it's it's not like it's not like the oldest house ever ends, <laughs> but you know I think that we are within two years of an FMV game that's going to make everybody on board with FMV again. I agree. I'm saying it here, I'm staking that position over here. here I in think this that's. Monastery, I'm I'm hanging banners that say FMV coming 2026. See, this is why you shouldn't have put Sean and I in opposite corners because we just keep taking our big our big colored gloves and shaking hands. We're sitting here in the <laughs> we're, we're coming up to each other and we're agreeing wholeheartedly. I love an FMV game, and I think that uh, I think you're exactly right about it being within the next two years. And I'll go so far and say that like it'll be like a 10 out of 10 yeah. game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like I already love, I loved an FMV game this year. I loved uh, cool. the um, immortality. It was amazing, and I. But I think it'll get. I think it'll get even weirder, and it'll get more classic FMV. Like you are, going from place to place. Whoa. <laughs> is immortality? Is that the one where you're an editor? Where you're you're scrolling through video footage. Yes, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. by Half Mermaid, uh, and the. It's incredible. It is such a such a good story done really really well, and they play with the form in such a fun way. But um, the the FMV game that you're kind of talking about, it's not exactly that. 
because you're watching uh-huh. the movies you're not um you're not in that world and i want uh-huh. that uh-huh. i want to be walking around in full motion video <laughs> solving <laughs> mysteries uh, i remember i enjoyed the tex murphy games uh what was that that just, did something just whooshed over my head another window <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I also don't know the Tex Murphy games. I am going to that, Google right now. Yeah, that that is a that is a FMV dete- detective approach that um I happen to have I have a bit of a soft spot for. <gasps> These look oh, amazing. What? I want to play it so bad. Whoa. <laughs> this oh my what, god. This is what I do. I drink and I know things. <laughs> but um it did. It did kind of amuse me that that you guys put in um, X Men twice, both the Claremont <laughs> era and the Krakoa era. They're oh. both very important to me. I had to include them, and I can tell you why if you'd like. I can talk Go about on. the influence. Go ahead. So X Men Krakoa is the like more straightforward one to talk about. A big part of what defines that era, especially when it began, was the sort of like set up that all of these superheroes are now able to uh, revive themselves anytime. And so death itself is not exactly the problem, but they still have all these other problems about how, most especially about how they relate to regular people and how those regular people uh, think about their ability to revive or all the other uh, things that they choose to do with their newfound independence as a mutant country. And while our game does not share a lot of things in common with X-Men, it does share that um, particular struggle. Uh, The characters in Triangle Agency are not in a lot of physical danger most of the time. They are able to die and then be brought back by the agency in order to continue their job uh, until the agency, you know, no longer has a use for them. So that part of that's typical in horror the fear of death is like not really a part of our game so a huge part of what you have to worry about and the things we give people to worry about in our game um are the the dealing with mundane influences and and people who might see you use your powers so that's the deep connection to croco and x-men and then claremont x-men uh is because i think there's nothing i will ever do in my life (laughs) that is not heavily influenced by Claremont era X-Men. Um, the level of melodrama, the love of uh, complicated villainous characters, the um, extremely powerful and interesting teams made of like extremely different and disparate people who all have really human desires and fears. Um, I just learned so much from Claremont and continue to. So I, it would, it would feel silly to not mention. Mm-hmm. And I, I can, I can certainly see that, as, especially given how, if we're talking, we're talk, if we're talking X Men, then Cla- then Claremont, Claremont and Byrne are ca- are kind of the godfathers of X Men as pe- as people understand it. And I suppose I suppose a distant third, just because he facilitated it, would be um, Jim Shooter. Although Shooter has complicated. A long- Complicated feelings about Jim Shooter. <laughs> but... Yeah, um, which it, complicated is the is definitely the best way to put it. Um, <laughs> I on one on one hand he could he could get a little obsessive. On the on the other hand, um, that uh, he di- he did he did go out of his way to tr- to try and ma- to try and make talent happy when he could. Um. He also got screwed over multiple t- multiple times, inclu- include including getting fired from the company he started in Valiant. Oh. Yeah, I'm afraid I uh, I don't know if I'm especially com- comfortable getting too deep into my opinions on Jim Shooter, but yeah. I uh, but yes, I agree with you. An important influence in X Men's history for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yes, the, yes, Stanley was the was the was one of the principal creators of X-Men, but there's a difference between being the guy who being the guy who made it and being the guy who made it as people understand it. Um I've jo- I've said I've said in the past one of the or- the origin point of the console style um video game RPG can be traced to Dragon Quest, but Dragon Quest doesn't really start in the way that everybody understands it until 3. I'm. I just got lost. How did we get to Dragon Quest? 
Tell um, me about. I'm excited. I love Dragon Quest, and I will talk about it all day. But how, what was the path there? I'm a little. Um, lost. I, I was using that as an example of the line between the origins to how people understand it now. Yes. Yeah, and that's how I would talk about Claremont. That like obviously Claremont came in pretty early, but so much of what anybody thinks the X Men is like really starts with Claremont's work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I will. I will admit. Th I will admit one of the other ones that um, was an interesting, interesting um, choice that on the on the list um, is Jujutsu Kaisen. Yes. Yes. I. I. Uh, this is another one of mine. You're you're hitting a lot of the ones that I threw in there. So Sean is is quietly smiling I'm just and nodding. Patiently, patiently stretching out my. You know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Jujutsu Kaisen uh, has a couple of pretty big influences on this work, but it's not unique to Jujutsu Kaisen. That's just the one that's most um, immediately uh, front of mind at this time. But a lot of what I love about. Um, role-playing games and a lot of the feelings that people seek from role-playing games are very present in shonen uh manga and anime um and so jujutsu kaisen has a, a couple of really specific connections they do a really great job of um establishing what the devils are or the 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 curses are in that one now i'm getting chainsaw man rolled in there too um is getting uh, what the curses are and and talking about how uh they work and building this really interesting um, second, uh, second level to reality that is operating separate from how we all understand it, and a lot of the way we think about anomalies is really influenced by that trend in shonen anime. The, the like I just said, the Chainsaw Man devils, the curses in that one. Um, Agents' powers and Triangle Agency have a lot in common with the like kind of curse user abilities you see in Jujutsu Kaisen, in that they are themed around like a specific idea, not necessarily a, a an individual power set in the way you'd see in X-Men where someone has like one cool power, but they are structured around a concept because anomalies are all about how humans perceive certain mm -hmm. ideas. So just like in Jujutsu Kaisen where they can get different powers around a particular concept, um, that is kind of how Triangle Agency abilities work in a way. It's still pretty different, but Jujutsu Kaisen is one that has been a huge influence on us. Plus, we we use the word domain in some cool ways in our game, and they also yeah. use it a lot in Jujutsu Kaisen. So yeah. that's the other tie. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. Now, our lawyers have been furiously working around the clock to get a trademark on domain. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the the odds of the odds of that happening are the same odds of of get of getting a tr of getting a trademark on the word edge. Well, you know, hey, you know, uh, all things are possible uh, when you when you study the law. So mm -hmm. that's what they said. After you get really high in law school, they tell you the truth is <laughs> all this stuff, yes, all word. this stuff, throw it out the window. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's all vibes when you get to high level court. I am cu I'm curious if anyone's brought up things like Men in Black or the Laundry Files to you guys. Oh my gosh! So Men in Black absolutely is is in here in terms of of concept. That's sort of covered by the X Files more directly, I think, uh, if we're trying to tie to it. But the Laundry Files I had not heard of at all, and now we're getting it every day in a good way, a positive way, because it turns out I'm going to love it. I am sure. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, I and but we have been hearing about it every day basically since the campaign launched, and I am ready. I'm I'm fully like I've ordered one from the library. I'm ready to read. <laughs> Uh, and in all fairness, the Laundry Files does ha um, does have its own TTRPG that w that uses um, Basic. Oh, cool! Uh, I'm excited to see that too. Then yeah. I'm like, I yeah. am everything about the the story is exactly up my alley, and I that's pretty obvious. So yeah. I'm super excited to check it out. Now, of all of all the d one thing that I did find interesting is for one. Your core mechanic is using d4s, and two, and two, it's always a it's always a rule of six. Mm -hmm. With yeah, we're always goal, rolling six d4 at a time. Yeah, with the goal of trying of trying to get as many threes at at a time. Um, how did the how did this particular approach come about? Because this is certainly an unusual an unusual approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first thing I think that's like uh, obvious at level one is like 
D4s are pyramids. They're made out of triangles. So from the beginning of preparing this game, that was like something that was a goal from the design. It was like, can we make it work with D4s? Because it's triangle agency and everything's in threes and everything's using triangles and D4s are uh, kind of underused. So we were like, that would be fun to build around. And then the reason for there being six and how our whole system works basically comes down to having done a lot of math after that, figuring out what we wanted the system to do, how many got the odds we wanted, um, how many was like reasonable to ask somebody to roll at one time, uh, and then uh, following through on our commitment to threes mm -hmm. as much as we could. Right, and and I think uh, part of the math also included, you know, how much we wanted, how powerful we wanted people to feel, mm -hmm. how what sort of ratio of successes to failures we wanted to curate around the table. Um, mm -hmm. Especially since, from as I understand it, your the closest thing to attributes. Is not is not is not doing some sort of flat modifier, but instead um, a representation of how much you can tweak. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're able to literally take dice in front of you, spend your points, and rotate them around to show a three, mm -hmm. um, and that is part of like uh, even that action of like taking the die and moving it is part of our ethos for triangle agency all the way down, which is that we want to make what you're doing at the table and what you're thinking about at a table and like player level to still be connected to what you're doing in the game um, at all times so that you're always aware that you're playing at both levels and that we're not scared of that. I think that um, there's a kind of immersion that comes from trying your best to smooth away the fact that you're at a table and like give people an immersion that has to do with being as low friction as possible and making sure that everybody can stay fully in universe we're less worried about that and more interested in the kind of immersion that comes from having every piece of the experience add to the experience even if it's not literally 100 percent of the time a like in fiction outside of body kind of vibe mm -hmm. and to th to that end, the the other th the other thing I that I couldn't help but notice within this is ha is how the is how um, there's the relationship between the die rolling and chaos, which is the which appears to be the resource that the GM uses to make players' life interesting. Yeah, the um, anything that you roll that's not a three out of the six d four creates a point of chaos. The GM gets to bank that chaos because anytime you get at least one three, you're succeeding. So players are succeeding all the time. Um, a, a, a huge amount of time players are succeeding, but also a huge amount of time they are adding chaos to the GM's pool. And at any time during the game, the GM can spend that chaos to uh, effectively purchase effects that come back to uh, hinder or hurt directly the agents on your team. So th what that does is it kind of skips the mixed success part and makes it something that's a little more dynamic and a little more active uh, for the GM. Which is an interesting approach because a lot a lot of times success and success can be can be put into the categories of yes or yet yeah, or yes but. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas. I'd say the I'd say the closest to yes but that I see here is the unstable is the unstable success, but the but doesn't ex doesn't have to take place at at the same time as the roll. It could, t but it is going to take place at some time. Yeah, it doesn't have to happen at the same time as the roll. It doesn't have to happen to the person who rolled. Um, that but is like fully under the control of the GM. Uh, which is true in most games, but we find the chaos system helps make that feel like very fair and kind of fun for the GM as well to have this yeah, like it's, moment. It's theatrical. The tension is slowly mounting as the players realize how much chaos has been contributed after all these roles, mm -hmm. <laughs> and no. everybody is pain acutely aware of how much chaos it takes to you know add a monster to the board or anything like that. Given how given how the given how the anomalies. Seen, are rooted in thought that um, bends reality. I am a bit curious if anyone's brought up unknown armies to you guys. No, that's not one I've heard at all. No, me neither. Unknown armies is is do, is doing a sim is doing a similar thing 
in a in a way, although its particular way is a bit cracked out. <laughs> um, I I remember I remember someone des someone describing Unknown Armies as the X Files as if, as if it was written by a flat earther high on co high on cocaine, which a bit of an extreme a bit of an extreme description, but not completely inaccurate. Uh, though th though since I since I've taken some of my weird fi some of my weird weird fiction descriptions from Hunter S. Thompson's work, who am I to talk? <laughs> uh, but one thing that one thing that I'm one thing that I'm curious about when it comes to what com when it comes to creating anomalies is what is what's the general umbrella that that anomalies should 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 be? Is it a case of things that are that that are in the ev in everyday world but kind of twisted or what what was the what was the design ethos you guys had when it came to creating anomalies? It's so free form. Like you're talking about should, and I I understand because I think when you're talking about role playing games, a lot of the time you're trying to design around a like pretty clear kind of set of conflicts. But our anomalies are very broad, and there are several different ways you can get to a pretty satisfying story at your table. We've played all different kinds of anomalies. Um, I've I've been running a bunch for this campaign, and there are a lot of like actual plays you can go out and listen to and i've done everything from like a an animal got an anomalous power and it just happens to have been found by a bunch of rich people who are using its power for their benefit all the way to like an ancient anomaly based on a greek myth who has existed for centuries is causing trouble in the city and the agents have to deal with that and it's like extreme power um there's so many levers you can pull for all different kinds of anomaly but they they, sh they absolutely go all the way from you know a stapler that is <laughs> firing staples at everybody around it to a like um relatively sentient and close to human creature that just has a very specific uh, agenda and a very strong power. Um, you can do any of those and put your agents against a variety of those, and the system still supports it. Mm -hmm. the, 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 I think the closest that we get to a should is that GMs should make sure that they find ways to make whatever the anomaly is relevant to the characters and relevant to the players at the table. Yes. Um, because if if the agents don't care about what the mission is the agency certainly doesn't there's going to be nobody there to you know to 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 care about how messy it gets just yeah exactly we we try to tie uh every character into their real life and the stakes about the normal people around them and the people they care about uh so at any time they're dealing with a mission, even if they can't die, a lot of the people they really, really care about can. And the GM has tools, including the chaos that we talked about earlier, that they can spend to make sure those people that are really relevant to them get drawn into whatever the uh, anomalies uh, domain or current conflict is, leading um, to what we hope are going to be like uh, pretty reliably emotional and um, exciting experiences for the teams. Mm-hmm. And I will I will admit that I did I did notice a bit of a pattern when it comes to when it comes to the bit when it comes to the abilities that you get from um, player anomalies. That is, yeah, let's talk about it. That I'm being, curious. The th the three the three angles seem seem to consistently be success, um, rule of rule of three, which I'm going to call, and failure. Yes, that's how they're all designed. Absolutely. Oh, um, oh sorry. Did you... Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, go, go on. Oh, no, I was just wondering what... what uh, if you had a question about that, because you, yeah, you identified um, it correctly. Yeah, I... Th was was that some was that something that came that came naturally once you once you guys decided on the way player anomalies were going to work, or was it something that... Um, required a bit of experimentation. 
definitely came naturally pretty early. And yeah. the reason for that is because in the Delta test, and as the game works right now, even without your anomaly, you're able to use the agency to adjust reality, to change things just slightly, to try to tweak how things exist uh, to, so to suit you. And that's a pretty basic role. It only has a success failure. So we knew that the anomalies needed to be more powerful than that in interesting ways and also messier. So exactly what you're describing, there's a failure state that's usually pretty nasty because it's kind of hard to fail in triangle agency. So we want every skill to have a really unique and interesting failure state uh, that can completely shape how the rest of your session and goes and p potentially inspires stuff for the rest of your campaign. Um, because it's going to happen so rarely. And then there are um, the success states, as you described, which have uh, a bunch of very interesting uses in investigations. And then in the middle, there's always one of a couple different things. One is an effect that could happen um, when you hit transcendence, which is exactly three threes naturally. Mm -hmm. One possibility is that it'll be something that happens for each additional three on your roll. So you can like, uh, it often those look like uh, purchasing additional extra effects or adding new targets to the initial success. And then the last one that can pop up is on every third three, which are usually the more powerful abilities, but that to get them, you're often going to have to spend your quality assurances. Um, so that is uh, that is kind of how we separate those, and that middle part is how we do the most like scaling of power and like balancing of different anomalies is about what those like middle abilities are and how they work. Yeah, mm -hmm. because just as often those middle abilities can also be like mitigate one drawback of the success state, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, uh, one of the abilities the middle state is. Uh, for every third th or for every additional three, pick one person who won't be scared of what you just did. <laughs> um, I will note when it comes to the reality part of the of the arc system that you guys have for characters, um, I do appreciate the relationship matrix because the relationship <laughs> part could be considered um, something that I call blank check design. Mm -hmm. Now, what blank check design. Is whenever is whenever there's a a certain mechanic whose specifics are filled in by either the player or the GM or or both, and when you give pe when you give people essentially a blank check, hence the name, it's important to get to um make it so that they don't so that they don't fall into the trap of um choice paralysis. Mm -hmm. A big example that I've that I've that I've mentioned in the past is. I've been very critical of the aspect system in Fate. Mostly because of the fact that Fate does not do an effective job, in my opinion, of guiding players between what is a good and bad aspect. Uh, and I'm talking about Fate Core with this. Some of the Fate settings do a, do a better job with this, but it's important to have that guidance so that both players and GM know where the line is. Uh, I see what you're saying. So you're talking about the relationship questions that mm -hmm. we've put in there. Yes. The, uh, I can I can explain a little bit about why we got to those because it's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, the most important part of the realities uh, is about making sure that by the time you start playing, everybody, including you, has a pretty strong idea and is excited about the like possibilities for your character's story, both like their like primary bit, like what their deal is and what they're worried about, but also what their dynamic might be with the important people in their lives and how those things can evolve. So for each of the realities, we tried to give them questions that almost always involve a power dynamic or a clear um, potential conflict. So uh, a lot of them will be name someone who is your manager, which gives you a really clear power dynamic. Mm -hmm. Or it will be um, pick someone who never remembers your very important job that you care about a lot. And that immediately gives you a conflict. You might not know what the power dynamic is with that person, but you do know what you're at least going to start out with with them that you maybe wish they knew what your thing was or you hope they never find out what your thing is because they're refreshing because they don't know. Um, it, it sets you up to have a lot of freedom for the details of the relationships, but it helps you um, jump into the game feeling like, oh, wow, not only did I create a character, I created a whole 
set of important things to them. And the relationship system as we've built it is so, so fun. It's my favorite part of our game because you don't just give those relationships to the GM, you give them to everybody at the table. So mm -hmm. each mm -hmm. person you play with and the GM all take one of the characters that you build at character creation. And whenever that character pops up, they will play it. And it keeps the table feeling super like um, uh, invested and involved in everybody's individual story. Mm -hmm. And something that I hadn't even considered until just now is that uh, you were describing this blank check design that could have the potential to... Th this blank check design in, in games as a whole that can set up adversarial relationships between players and GMs. That idea that you, ha that you create your relationship and then you hand control over it to the person sitting next to you is a huge sort of safety valve on that where it can be really difficult to make any one person at the table's life difficult mm -hmm. you're you're all sharing the story together uh, yep and to to shift it to shift back into dice for a minute this there's one question i wanted to ask because i did because it kind of skipped it kind of skipped past me at the at the moment um how do you guys feel about the concept of fail forward I love it. Yeah, uh, fail forward is great. I think um, lots of games do that incredibly well, and we have that in here. The idea that the failures push us into bigger stories. We just want those to be rare enough and big enough that they are very memorable. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind um, of our goal. <laughs> just to make sure we're on the same page, I've always defined fail forward as the idea that a fit as a failure, a fail, a failed role does not mean the story stops. Yes. Yes. Precisely. Could not agree more with that as a design goal. And and I challenge you to find one failure state <laughs> listed in the anomalies that would make the story suddenly stop. One of my favorites to say, that's actually probably one of the meanest ones. Like, I would say even this one is maybe the one in my head that I would think is the closest to, like... <laughs> <laughs> like a, a a disruptive failure to the story, but it's still really fun. We had it happen in a a stream with Plus One EXP uh, a few weeks ago. Is the whisper, which is a uh, an anomaly that has to do with voices and um, and words, mm -hmm. has a failure state for one of their abilities where you try to make someone say a sentence, and part of how it succeeds is that they kind of believe they intended to say that sentence. So you can shift what's happening to you by making somebody important say something meaningful at a good time. However, if you fail, your voice gets stuck, only able to say the words in the sentence you tried to get them to say. So we had a character then who had tried to do this big thing, shift this, this person's voice to make their lives really easy, and it rebounded on them, making it so that now they had to only use the like eight words they had available. And it created this incredible comedy for that character um a frustration for the player in a small way but a like overall um group and en uh, enjoyment and positive experience that came from that player rising to the challenge of needing to continue to play and communicate uh despite that uh, limitation mm -hmm. now of, co of course the th the um third the third part of our of the arc system is is um competency which um seems to seems to seems to t tie into how someone's going to be get one of some of the main ways in how someone's going to get commendations and demerits as well as there as well as a, f a couple of, as well as a couple of other things um name namely the namely quality assurance which is the tweak we mentioned before um when it comes to when it comes to competency, we've we talked about some we talked about some of the patterns with the other two. What was the main pattern that you guys fell into when it came to designing competencies for the game? A pattern. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, yeah. I I think we said once we settled on the form, it became a it became an interesting exercise to see how we could make them each feel meaningfully different. They're right. definitely the hardest ones to make. Yeah. Of all of the character pieces, like I could, 
I could on this call right now probably throw out three more realities that are pretty close because I love them and they're like mm -hmm. they're so fun to make and they're also like based on character types that you see all over the place but what the competencies are based on is table rules like they're based on how you role play and some games have rules like this like they they talk they try to get to your character archetype by telling you how most you should solve problems or like how you could create problems for yourself in a way that lines up with your character and because our game is about working for this company that has a bunch of strange uh, desires for you and opinions on how the world should work, we built the competencies to have your, your player, you yourself, as well as your agent, have to be dealing with that challenge. So the competencies are, are designed with two major pieces, the prime directive, and then the sanctioned behaviors. The prime directive, while the actual text of the first part of it is usually in the in the foreword, it's the like make uh, keep them laughing or something like that. The actual meat of the prime directive is a limitation. It is a thing you're not allowed to do in role play because if you do it, you get a demerit. Sometimes they're very big challenges. Like uh, public relations is not allowed to lie at all, which is a challenge for any character in any role playing game. And then the uh, some of them are a little bit more straightforward, but still come up a lot. Like the, um, the uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> the word just left my head. Reception. The reception who is not allowed to sit down. You, you as a player can sit down, but your character can't. And what that suddenly makes you do is start thinking about all the times that you might casually sit as a character. All the times that it's assumed everybody just kind of sits. Uh, the typical, like, and then we all hang out in a tavern moment becomes more complicated if your character is literally not allowed to sit at a table. Um, and we tried to make all the prime directives feel that way, where it's something that you as a player are having to think about as well as your character, because it changes the way you roleplay. Yeah. Now, given given that most of the, that the anomalies that will be encountered during missions are composed of focuses and domains, in the full book, do you plan on putting in a short list of examples of both that that can be used by GMs? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a very tiny list in the current Delta test, but there will be much more. And we have, in our campaign right now, coming out alongside our rulebook, a set of 12 missions being written by a bunch of different writers who are all going to be approaching anomalies and triangle agency missions from kind of a different perspective. And we're hoping that that book, as like a pairing, will help any GM who's a little nervous, like see all the different directions they could take the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can get, I can get that because, and I'd, I'd imagine that there's that um for for each of the each of the part each of the analysis each of the parts of the anomaly an, ah anomaly English monk. Analysis mm -hmm. char analysis chart in the mission report is going to have a few examples that GMs can draw from in the full book. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, once once again, there, once again, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that this kind of th that this kind of thing can go. Um, now, given given that role play is role play's main reward is dem is commendations, demerits, and potentially loose ends. Um, I am curious how how the, how those three things get used because unless I'm mistaken, they are a kind of currency. Yes, yeah, and in the Delta test, uh, they are a little bit of a mystery. They're there in in term and then in vibe, uh, but we don't really dig deep into character progression, so they are not included in the one shot version of the game. I think you'll still find they're very fun to play with and fun to think around, but the actual things you use them for will be different in the main game. Those things are, the commendations are going to be used most especially to purchase requisitions, which are uh, an equivalent to, uh, I guess you could say magic items in other games. They're things the agency has uh, designed to help you with uh, missions or to improve your life in various ways that you're able to purchase as like a thank you from the agency of doing a good job the way that they want uh, at your job. Demerits are, uh, a way for the agency to track how poorly you have been doing according to their opinion of you. And that is going to be tied to the agency taking moves against you or potentially punishing you for having failed to live up to its standards. Mm -hmm. Loose ends are, to be honest, 
I want to leave a little bit of mystery there because we're doing some really fun stuff with what loose ends are going to do in your campaign that your GM might not even tell you right at first. But I can say that loose ends are very important to the agency um, because anomalies are born out of observation, as we discussed earlier. They're born out of people's thoughts and feelings and worries. And something the agency is very nervous about is that if a lot of people are thinking about anomalies, they are also empowering those anomalies. And so loose ends represent a potentially um, exponentially increasing challenge for the future of the agency's goals and for reality's stability broadly, according mm -hmm. to the agency. Yeah, and this, this is also, when it came to the loose end issue, this is also the reason why I, uh, br I brought up Men in Black earlier. Because there was yes. there was that whole there was that whole speech on the bench about what about why, um why all why even though there's thousands of aliens living in living in Manhattan, um why the big secret about it, um and that that whole speech ab about how every about how people all all knew cer all knew certain things even if even if they weren't the case, and and now. It's, it's best to have people not know just so that they just so that they the uncertainty doesn't create a panic yeah I would say that's the the agency's issue is um, is definitely similar to that but I would say that it's definitely more a little more um, <laughs> is metaphysical the right word they're not as concerned about people's feelings I would say they're concerned about the uh, potential effect on how the world even works. Mm -hmm. Oh, and give, given that, oh, I will admit with, that when you mentioned requisition, the first thing that came to mind was the noisy cricket, mostly because I like I like giving my players powerful but dangerous equipment. <laughs> you know, can punch a hole through just about anything, but you're going to get knocked on your ass every time you fire it. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of. Stuff exactly like the noisy cricket. That's a great thing to uh, <laughs> to call in. Actually, I had not thought about that in a long time, but you're absolutely right. And well, a re a recurring trap that I that I use in some of my games. It that uh, going back to some of my earliest AD and D adventures is a rune trap called the up button. Oh it no! Is, when you, you step on. on when you step on the thing, you go up. You're essentially going straight up at about at about um sixty at about forty miles an hour for six seconds, oh. and um, the most infamous use of it was at the was in a fight in a fight against a dragon, with in a cave who that was lined with adamantite. If you know anything about adamantite, you know that's not going to budge for anything. <laughs> um, the dragon ends up stepping on the trap, hits the ceiling. The GM's like, all right, now it comes down. It's like, nope, and I'm like, no, it doesn't. It still ha it still has five more seconds. It was like, but it's at it's at a man tight. That stuff's not gonna move. I didn't put a I I didn't put a in case in case you run into an immovable object clause when I made the thing. You step <laughs> on the thing, you go up. You and um, the result was the equivalent of what happens when a car is in a compactor. Oh no! I don't like that. Cause, Poor dragon. Because, well, the, the ceiling the, again. The ceiling was made of adamantite. That's not gonna. That's not going to budge. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I'm fully. Yeah. With I've absorbed you. that part. Yeah. <laughs> so I was gonna say. I was gonna say. It's funny that you bring up that particular effect because the one example anomaly in the Delta test. That's also its power. <laughs> is exactly that. <laughs> it's. It's just. All right. Now you're going upwards. You go up. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Gr granted, all all of us had all of us had to ro all of us had to roll to resist losing our lunch, which I think was the GM's revenge for the fact that he got outsmarted. <laughs> I know. I believe that. I would also probably need to roll against losing my lunch if I watch that happen in front of me. I think that's a really reasonable call. <laughs> yeah. But one of the... now when it come when it comes to when it comes to anom when it comes to anomalies, um, 
I'm guess I'm guessing that within the full book you're gonna have adv you're going to have advice on how to how how to how to make sure that how how to make sure that it's not just a one one off monster of the week but something that has multiple um, phases throughout an encounter. That's interesting. Um, I think that we're gonna let GMs kind of decide how they want to handle each um, each anomaly, and we do want to make ones that can last. Um, multiple sessions or, or sort of uh, escape and return and, and mess with you before they get to a point where they can be captured. But we are designing primarily around actually Monster of the Week style um, anomaly uh, situations where you are um, over the course of a single mission hopefully reaching a kind of conclusion with that anomaly whether it's that you successfully capture it or that it escapes or that you have to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And um, and we want the game to not always need you to capture to move forward. Your, um, your character progression is based on how much time you spend on the job, not based on how you succeed. So you might get some demerits, but you're still moving forward in your character's life no matter what happens. And each way an anomaly can sort of end its, mm -hmm. uh, its experience with you still opens up doors yeah there are different doors depending on what happens but in the final game it opens up different paths there mm. if you don't mind me throwing throwing a name out there there is one particular anime that i think would make great research material for handling anomalies oh please what is it um mononoke oh yes yes now i need i need to make explicitly clear for anybody listening i am not referring to the studio g the Studio Ghibli and Hayao, Hayao Miyazaki work. Oh, Princess I thought Mononoke. you were, and I'm like, that actually would work. <laughs> no, it would, but um, but Mononoke, the series I'm referring to, is a bit would be a bit more direct on the matter. That story, that story is a spinoff from the from one of the stories in an anthology anime called Ayakashi Samurai Horror Stories. Oh, and, I haven't heard of this, and I'm looking at it right now, and it's so beautiful. It deals. It deals with a with a man. Although whether he's human is is um ne is up to is up for debate. Known as the medicine seller, who is essentially a traveling exorcist, one who who, who um is it is able to eliminate um es essentially cr cryptid like things known as ayakashi. It that's the simple way to put what ayakashi is. It's when you're dealing with mythology, things get complicated. The only, but in order to, in order to, in order to be able to to exercise them, there's three things he needs. Um, it's translated as form, truth, and regret. But regret, um, which I, I believe was Kotowari, can also can also translate to reasoning. It's one of the it's. Trans translations are, are are a tricky affair, but basically those three things are needed in order to exercise that particular um, ayakashi. Yes, this is exactly you're you're right. I'm looking at it right now also, and it I am stunned at how gorgeous this anime is, and that I've never seen it before. The yeah. art style is so beautiful, and the like, the it's very spooky as well, and manages to do this really cool surreal stuff. I'm like stunned. I, I'm going to go watch it right away. But the yeah, yeah, same. But you're right that that exact thing of of having to find the figure out the pieces of the anomaly and understand it, even if you don't fully get it, to at least understand it enough to um, uh, to follow its logic into exhausting it or calming it down, is absolutely what you have to do. And those pieces that you're describing, while they're not uh, exactly the like focus domain and modus operandi that we talk about in the book, they do definitely line up. Um, Mm -hmm. in a cool way yeah and the big reason that, the big reason the, I bring these kind of things up is much like with the blank check design thing I mentioned before when it comes to the concept of anomalies the sky is quite literally the limit yes <laughs> and, again with the up rune yeah <laughs> well somebody did use it in, out, in an outdoor spot and um, the and they get, they got a very quick flying lesson. Name or also known as 
what the following lesson? Yes. <laughs> um, I I at least it was an opportunity to exp to explain to to explain to my uh, to explain to my players at the time what the vomit comet is. No. Don't worry. It's nothing nasty. That's just the nickname that they give it. <laughs> it is. It's how. It's how. Um. It's how filmmakers will simulate zero g, for for scenes, especially if they're zero g scenes in say space. Uh -huh. Um. They'll ha they'll have a they'll have a they'll bring a plane up into with the set into the air, and then slowly drop it for a for a for a period of time. Because when you're falling, you're technically weightless. Uh huh. You know, if I'm sorry, if you had this up room this whole time, why did you make us take all those stairs to get up here? <laughs> <laughs> because here we are, here we are, exhausted and not fighting. We're not putting on the show that everybody here paid to see, and we could have just up ruined it. You <laughs> just hit that button for this for the same for the same reason. Nobody goes to work via cannon fire. You would miss. <laughs> no, I'm built different. I would, I would make it. Yeah, I bet I could make it. I actually think I would just make it. <laughs> it's the, it's the same reason. Um, Nightcrawler is Nightcrawler has ish wants to see where he's going when he's teleporting, just in case he teleports into a wall or something. Well, I can see the monastery. Yeah, and it's not the same reason because if I was Nightcrawler, I also would never teleport into a wall. I would just do do it good. You just do it good. <laughs> Right, that because is, of my instincts and my training. Right, that's, exactly. Uh, yeah. That sounds like that's that is the kind of thinking that leads to Darwin Awards. <laughs> mm, no, I would never get a Darwin. <laughs> yeah, I'm, pretty... I'm too busy never dying. No, yeah, you wouldn't I'm, get a Darwin Award. You would, you would just get an you would just get an honorable mention. Right, right. An honorable mention. Uh, posthumously after I died like for perfectly normal and regular reasons because they were like man we really hoped we'd get to give him a Darwin award but we didn't get around to it because he yeah, did such I, a good job I think if anything the the way that I would mess things up is that I would die surrounded by too many loved ones too <laughs> right uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. how could you that's the Darwin award yeah too many people are going to talk about you forever <laughs> positively a able amount <laughs> of calm that you're experiencing yeah. And satisfaction. Um, and sometimes so, making an anomaly for triangulate yeah. C is just that easy. It's just like that. We've done it yeah. today. Well, there was a Darwin Award recipient where somebody decided to attach solid fuel rocket boosters to their car. <laughs> no, I, um, I've been talking about good. real Darwin Awards. It's just going to make me sad. It's just going to make me sad again. But... Yeah. Um, uh, oh, just so you know, Bilger, I think I'm coming up on the time I have to go. My <laughs> husband is waiting on me. No, no worries. So, with the f with the full book, what are you guys shooting for as far as the page count? Yes, so the core book, uh, we are estimating coming in around 200 pages. Mm -hmm. um, that is going to be split into basically three different parts um, that are in some cases sold separately, but in our case, we're keeping it bound together. There is the uh, field agent manual, which is uh, previewed on the Delta test, as well as mm -hmm. the general manager's toolkit, both mm -hmm. of which have uh, Delta test versions. And then both of those are going to be expanded. And then there is a third section that is not, um, not quite as inviting to straight through reading, which is the classified documents. It is a set of things for character advancement, things for the GM to use, and things that can happen to your characters as their careers move forward that you don't necessarily have access to at the front. Um, mm -hmm. So the agency tells you not to read them, uh, and they are um, in order that is uh, intended to make it a little confusing to try to parse exactly what's going to happen, um, much in the way that a uh, like a, an adventure book like a choose your own adventure book is um, made into a bit of a maze. The classified document section is a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be looking forward to, to seeing how it develops. And as an aside, I do want to congratulate you guys on, on, um, on the fact that you managed to get, you managed to um, get well over the goal because you were asking for 9,999 um, 
which I'm guessing you went with that because of rule of three. <laughs> <laughs> right, 10,000 is where we're at, but we were like, well, it's got to be threes. <laughs> and yeah, we, I figured I could chip in $1. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time of this recording, it's at 178.8 thousand. Ooh, baby. Ooh. Uh, that is never going to feel normal. No, it's a very weird time right now for us. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm rocketing towards that anomaly, man. Just surrounded by too much success and, <laughs> and accolades from loved ones. Yeah. But I, but like I said, I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. And thank with, you. With thank that, you. with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mildred. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss Triangle Agency or whether it's to dis- whether it's to discuss how bad how bad somebody's role was, um, the <laughs> door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> and I hope you have a great night. Mm-hmm. Yep, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! (laughs) 